Hi, thanks everybody. Um, my name is Dana and I'm one of the nephrologists at Tufts Medical Center. Um, the way this, this session is gonna work, we're gonna uh, have slides for 20, 30 minutes and I'm a physician, I'll give you my perspective. Then we'll have Jerry, who's a patient, give his perspective about living on dialysis. And then we'll have 15 minutes for um, questions. Okay, so first slide here. Um, the key point I wanna make on this slide is that polycystic kidney disease uh, makes up a very small proportion of the dialysis population in the United States. So any statistics that you hear about the United States renal data system or dialysis patients population-wise usually don't apply to the PKD population. And, and the, when I'm, why I'm saying this is because you'll hear this statistic that the median survival of a dialysis patient once they start is four years, meaning 50% live four years and 50% go beyond that. Um, but that really doesn't apply to PKD, okay? The PKD patients are younger and healthier. They tend to do much better than, than the average dialysis patient. Next slide. Oh, can you advance, Jerry, please? Ah, I'm not sure he is. Jerry, can you hear me? Can you advance, please? I think he may be froze up. There we go. Okay. Um, I did. There was a slide in the middle. Yeah, it was a little bit frozen there. If I can, it, I'm uh, unfortunately. I... Yeah, that's fine. Oh, Don't go back. It was just showing the of the so that first slide I showed you was cause of kidney failure, but you know grouped uh, on the x-axis there and. The uh, and we can see that three percent of the of the dialysis population was PKD. Okay, now here what I'm showing you is the number who have transplant by cause of dial, uh, kidney failure. So first column here, diabetes. The dark blue is the the modality of of uh, that they're using for the renal replacement therapies. The modalities include blue is in center hemodialysis, red is home dialysis, gray is peritoneal dialysis, and green is transplant. So these are data from 2019. That's the most recent data we have available to us at this time from the USRDS. But basically you can see here, like I said earlier, PKD are quite unusual compared to other uh, pa patients on dialysis, the vast majority of which are diabetics and hypertensive. You know, the vast majority of our PKD patients actually are transplanted. Here you can see it's about 60%. PD makes up a larger proportion than, well, sort of actually the same home dialysis is lower than the, than the other group. So a lot of PKD patients end up getting transplanted. Uh, next slide, please. But this talk is about dialysis. And so um, I had four tips I was gonna give you about how to do well on dialysis. And I'm just waiting for Jerry to advance the slide. Um, but the first tip I, I have for you is, to, is really to work on getting a kidney transplant your survival will be longer and your quality of life will be improved by transplant. For the vast majority of patients who have end-stage renal disease, they will do better to have a transplant. And so what that means is uh, if you work on getting a potential living donor, okay, so you ask your family or friends if any of them are interested in giving you a, a kidney, it's unusual and it's harder in a PKD family because there's so many patients, you know, so many people, relatives affected with PKD. Um, but even if there's a friend, we're, we'd be interested in these people, friends, distant relatives, etc. Even if they're not a match to you, they could be a match to a potential other recipient. And there's a, a matched paired exchange program in the United States where we can actually swap kidneys around. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff we can do with living donors. So first, see if there's a living donor potential. Then get yourself waitlisted. So you visit a transplant center and you undergo an evaluation. And then you officially get waitlisted on the deceased donor list. And um, <clears throat> you should do this even if you have a living donor potential, because you never know what may happen in a living donor. Uh, although if it's a young person, they're usually going to be just fine. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, just, just so you know this, you can be waitlisted as soon as your GFR is 20. So you don't have to be on dialysis to start accruing wait days. You start accruing that time once your GFR hits 20. So you should start getting evaluated then, get yourself on the list. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Oh, 
the next slide is going to, it talks about doing home dialysis. So I mentioned on the earlier slide with the blue, red, and gray colors, the three main types of dialysis we offer in the United States in an outpatient facility. And those are in center hemodialysis, where you go to the center three times a week, you get your dialysis treatment done by a nurse. Usually the sessions are three and a half, four hours, and then you go home. The second kind of dialysis we offer is PD, peritoneal dialysis. This is where you have a, a, a catheter um, inserted into your abdominal wall, sort of anchored in the abdominal wall. The end of it sits down in your pelvis. We fill your, this, this space between sort of your abdominal wall and your intestinal contents, like your liver and intestines and all that. There's a space there. We can fill it with fluid. Uh, and this, a little machine usually does this for you while you're sleeping. It's called a cycler. So it'll fill you with fluid. The blood vessels lining the intestines carry all the toxins into this fluid uh, dwelling there and the toxins diffuse out in the fluid. And then the machine after an hour and a half usually kicks into drain mode and drains this empty, dirty kind of dialysate fluid and then refills you again. And usually you get cycles like this four or five times a night while you're sleeping. Um, some people have referred to that as a third kidney. It's very physiologic. Um, it's, it's replicating more closely than hemodialysis, what your kidneys actually do. Um, and the third kind of dialysis is at home hemodialysis. Uh, so the reason I want you to think about home is for a number of things. The first being that in center hemodialysis is really very um, exhausting for people. Like just the schlepping back and forth is quite taxing. You know, you have to get to the dialysis center. If you don't have a ride there, then you have to have a, a ride take you there, wait for the ride. It's almost like going to an airport when waiting for one of those shuttle buses. That happens three times a week for you. And then you have to wait for them to pick you up. Um, then you're sitting in this chair three and a half, four to four hours. And it's, it's very, it's very aggressive. It's very invasive. So we're basically taking all the blood out of your body, running it through a washing machine, taking all the fluid off that you gain between treatments, putting it back into your, your body. It's, it's, it's not very physiologic and people often feel very exhausted after in-center hemodialysis. When you do PD in particular, it's a daily therapy, but it's gentle. It, there's not these abrupt changes in, in uh, solutes and in, in volume. So it, it's usually people don't feel drained as much as they do on, on the in-center hemodialysis, which are these short, aggressive uh, therapy, you know, in treatments. Um, the, it, it just so happened, oh, it's the next slide, Jerry. It just so happens yeah. the, the, the third uh, kind of dialysis is home hemodialysis. That takes more work to learn at home, um, but ultimately we can teach you how to do that as well. Um, the training for PD is usually in the order of about a week. So not very long. You go every day for the week, learn how to do the exchanges, and then we'll send you on your way and you, you do it at home by yourself. And usually um, people learn that very quickly. Hemodialysis usually takes more like six weeks. The main issue is learning how to cannulate your fistula um, and, and how to run the circuit and all this, but it's not nothing that you couldn't learn. We've had lots of people train in he home hemodialysis and um, a, a key advantage of doing dialysis at home is self-involvement, okay? If you're in charge of things and you're doing it yourself, you're more aware of what your numbers are, your clearance, your your electrolytes, your, you know, your bone and mineral metabolic parameters, all these things that the MD is watching, you're actually watching this stuff yourself and you'll do better for it because you'll be more aware of what, what causes these things to be off and what you would do to fix these things. It's always the case in medicine. The more involved a patient is in their care, the better they do. So that's a huge advantage of, of doing dialysis at home, either peritoneal or home hemodialysis. Okay. Now, the, th the third slide I was going to have, my third point for you was to watch your fluid. So what happens when you start dialysis, depends what kind of dialysis you start. Basically, when you start hemodialysis, I told you already, it's fairly invasive, fairly aggressive. You know, we're taking two, three kilograms of fluid off. Your blood pressure can drop. Just your blood running through the, this plastic tubing, all this incites inflammation possibly, and this is it can cause your kidneys to fail. So you become anuric, okay? Meaning you don't make urine anymore. And with a hemodialysis uh, patient, that usually happens fairly early on, one to three months after starting dialysis. Um, 
the with the peritoneal dialysis patient, usually that lasts much longer. We don't fully understand why that's the case, but on average, I'd say our PD patients are maintaining urine output for a good one and a half, two years. Now there's not a whole lot of solute clearance happening with that urine output, but what the advantage is, is that, there, that there's volume getting out of you. You're making urine. So you're not, you don't have to be as strict about the fluid that you gain between treatments. Also the treatments are every day. So that will limit you reduce the amount of, you have to restrict your fluids. Um, that's a huge advantage to you. I think one of the hardest things for patients on dialysis is, is to, to try to restrict their fluids. It can be really tough. You know, you're thirsty, but you can't drink. You can drink 32 fluid ounces a day is what we recommend because that's what we can safely pull off in a three, three and a half, four hour session. If you drink more than that, what happens is your heart gets overloaded. And you can imagine you go to the dialysis session, your heart is full like a balloon you can imagine is what I want you to think about the, the balloon is stretched out you pull off the two and a half three kilos in that treatment maybe more if you gain more and then the blue the, the heart rapidly shrinks down and you keep doing this repeatedly every three you know three times a week this stretching and and rapid shrinking of the heart over you know a very short space of time three and a half hours it's probably not good for the heart in fact we have studies showing that this uh it leads to stunning of the, the heart as a muscle, you know, so it gets stretched out, it loses its elasticity. So it's, it's called stunning. Eventually, if you have too much stunning, they're, 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 you, you develop fibrosis, sort of irreversible change on the heart. That's quite extreme, I have to say, volume overload chronically that would do that. That is that phenomenon, volume overload has been associated with with earlier death of a, of a dialysis patient. So it's extremely important to control your volume. Um, the other problem with pulling too much fluid is, is that you crash your blood pressure. So you, you imagine you're trying to take quite a bit of fluid out of your intravascular space. There's only so much there and you have to refill the intravascular space from your tissue, all that takes time. And, and so you can drop your, your blood pressure precipitously. That's not good for any your organs, your brain probably has a mild lack of blood flow to the brain. It's probably not good for a long time, long-term heart as well. Um, so, so these things we know um, are, are very detrimental. In fact, I'd say are the biggest sort of challenge we have with, with our dialysis patients, especially in center hemodialysis because the treatments are so infrequent three times a week. So whatever kind of dialysis you choose, I will say to you, a key principle that you, you got to sort of tackle is, is to figure out how you can drink less. And we want you to drink usually about a liter a day. If you're still making urine, you, don't, you won't have a stricter fluid uh, restriction. But if you've stopped making urine, it, that is the general rule of thumb, not to drink more than a liter a day. Okay, and the final point I'll make is just be healthy. And this is stuff you already already know. You were doing it before you started dialysis, keep doing it. So eat unprocessed foods, um, maintain a healthy weight if you're overweight, we want you to lose it, but safely. So you'd work with a dietitian. do that. If you're um, underweight, you should gain weight. I will say this, dialysis is, a, is catabolic. It's taxing on the body. So a lot of patients actually lose weight when they're on, on dialysis. Um, there can be various reasons for that. A lot of that we actually don't understand. Um, and I have to say, I find that more to be in diabetics and sort of patients with chronic infections. They, you know, a diabetic has lots of other problems other than just kidney failure. They've got infections in their feet and bad heart disease and all the rest of it. So those patients are the ones typically are losing weight. Regardless, uh, uh, the principle stands. If you're overweight, you want to lose weight. If you're underweight, you gain weight. And there's a dietitian dedicated in the dialysis unit to work on this and other issues with diet uh, for the dialysis patients. And then the other last thing is be, stay physically and mentally active. Um, Mental health usually is persistent, it persists, which is remarkable actually. Dialysis patients are a really resilient bunch is what I'm gonna say. They're tough. Their mental health usually doesn't decline once they start dialysis from all the studies that we've done. What declines is their physical health. So it's, it, like I said, it can be a wasting process. You, you start to lose your muscle mass. You start to get very sedentary, maybe because you're exhausted, but you gotta somehow overcome that and keep walking, keep walking stairs. More than that, if, if, you, if you were doing this before, you would keep going to the gym, whatever you can do physically to keep your muscle mass and to keep strong, keep your bones in good shape so that when the day comes that they call you with the transplant, you want to be strong physically um, that you're, you're going to do well after surgery. 
okay, so that's what I'm gonna ha I have to say about sort of four tips on how to stay healthy on dialysis. I'm gonna turn over to Jerry, who's gonna give you the patient perspective. Oh, Jerry, you're muted. Uh, there you go. Good morning. <laughs> so, so I have to first apologize, Dana, for uh, the slides freezing up on me, and hopefully uh, we're over that obstacle. Um, no, we're not. So I'm going to have to uh, work with uh, without a slide. I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm actually going to go to the slide so that I can read off the slides. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, hemodialysis, which is the choice of dialysis I chose. And before I get started, I wanna make a disclaimer. Hemodialysis at a center is no way a recommendation or a promotion for the hemodialysis. Uh, what I would say that in my case, I did research with my nephrologist very closely with my nephrologist and came to the conclusion that based on pros and cons, the best way, the best uh, means of dialysis, hemodialysis. In fact, uh, others that are approaching dialysis, I would highly recommend that you do the same thing. Look at the pros and cons of dialysis with your hemodialysis and choose what's best suited for you. As an example, my father who had PKD, he chose hemodialysis at home and my mother was his technician. My sister, on the other hand, she chose um, peritoneal dialysis at home. So we all chose different routes of uh, dialysis. And it, came, and it comes down to is what's best suited for the individual. So getting started, I had kidney failure at the age of 54 and began, began hemodialysis. And one comment is, Working very closely with my nephrologist, we were map, mapping out and plotting out and getting an estimate when I would uh, go into failure. And about a year estimated to failure, I, uh, I took action to get a fistula installed because a, a fistula, it does take months to develop. And in addition, I took steps to be tested and placed on the transplant list. And that was, again, about a year before I had failure. So when, when hemodi prior to hemodialysis, again, I did searching for pros and cons of the hemo versus perineal. And my pros with hemodialysis and outside center were, I needed some flexibility because at the time I was doing extensive traveling for work. In fact, I had probably more than 30 treatments across the United States and more than a dozen treatments in Europe. So it was very easy for me just to pick up and go and schedule the treatments uh, across this, the states in, uh, in Europe. I also wanted trained techs and nurses for my care. Uh, my, as I'd mentioned, my father had my mother as the tech. I didn't want to bring that to the house. And that's just a personal uh, opinion. Uh, you may have different, uh, different ideas and thoughts. Um, personal choice, I didn't want supplies and equipment at home, and I didn't want a dedicated treatment room. And again, that's a personal choice because I didn't want a constant reminder of the uh, dialysis cons. And there's a significant amount of cons that come with uh, hemodialysis, as Dana mentioned. First is the fistula. It's the first is the installation of the fistula. And as I mentioned, it takes months for it to develop. And it also takes uh, maintenance. In fact, the first fistula that I had uh, failed and I had to have a second fistula installed. The second is the needles. And I would say that uh, that was a big issue for me because I had a phobia of needles. So it took me quite a bit of time to overcome the, uh, the needle insertion, insertions. Another issue with the needles is what's called in infiltration at which the needles actually are placed into the fistula and outside go through the wall and when the machine starts you're pumping blood into the arm these are all cons with uh, hemodialysis and then the bandaging after the treatment uh, there can be uh, 
failed bandaging with bleeding after after the treatment. So all these need to be taken into consideration. In addition, it's very strict diet and liquid intake. And I learned early on that if I minimize my diet and my liquid intake, I actually felt much better, much less fatigue, if at all, fatigue after the treatment. So strict diet and liquid in intake was extremely important as how you feel after your treatment. 10 minutes, Jerry, 10 minutes. Living the best life on hemodialysis. And, and I think the most important is maintain a positive mental attitude. For me, di I view dialysis as a stepping stone for a transplant. And indeed, that's exactly what happened for me. And as Dana mentioned, exercise. I walked uh, twice a day and I continue to walk uh, a mile each each period of time, regardless of the uh, the weather. I continue to work to keep occupied, and luckily it wasn't physical labor. It was uh, basically I could work off of a computer anyway, anywhere. Travel, it was easy for me to schedule hemodialysis again across the U.S. and Europe, and I've traveled uh, from Florida out to uh, Washington State, and as I'd mentioned, uh, trips to uh, Europe. I uh, hiked the Grand Canyon while I was on dialysis and uh, took many. I uh, enjoy riding motorcycles, so I took uh, several motorcycle trips. So after four and a half years, I received the call uh, that a kidney had, been come, had become available, so I did have a transplant. It's now going on six and a half years since I've had the transplant. So that ends my presentation. I believe that would open the floor up for uh, for questions. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Uh, we've got a couple of questions already. For those of you who haven't had a chance, to, please type any questions you have into the chat box and I'll read them out for our presenters. Uh, please remain on mute if you wouldn't mind. So the first question that's come up is, um, um, regarding the match pair program that you mentioned, Dana, what's the best resource to find out more about how the match pair exchange program works? Um, someone's got a sort of diff different blood types and you know, how, how, does that, how does that matching with the different blood types work? Yeah, what I'd say to this person is talk to their transplant program and the, it, that, that's your best resource, okay? It, they're the ones who are gonna have to submit your pair to the, to the pairing exchange program to begin with. So I would refer this person to, to their transplant coordinator. Okay, thanks. And the next one, is it possible to do PD manually? Like, you know, when, when you go traveling? Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, so the cycler is only one way to do PD. You can actually do manual exchanges. So you have this IV pole or whatever, hang it off a shower or any kind of high object in a hotel room, whatever you have available. I guess we had a patient who was even camping in a clean way. They hung it off a tree branch. Um, just something that's high that'll, gravity will pull the fluid in your belly. So. You have the bag hanging there, you you connect, you know, make your sterile connection to your PE catheter and still the two liter bag or however much volume you're going to put in. D disconnect, go on your merry way for three hours, do your thing. And then when you cut, you cut, you know, three hours later, you come back and connect to your, uh, your uh, discard bag and uh, uh, you drain and then refill again. So yeah, definitely. You can, that's one of the advantages. I mean, is Jerry, you were lucky. <laughs> you had no problem um, arranging uh, hemodialysis sessions over the U.S. and Europe. I don't often. I mean, it can sometimes can be tough depending on what location you're going to. Um, in my experience, so PD, one of the advantages we always say is you can go traveling and arrange everything yourself. You just get back or deliver the the uh, boxes of of your uh, your your bag. You know your the, the fluid exchange, your dialysate to the, wherever your location is. They can do that all. You Baxter's all over the world. So you pretty much just go with it, with just the catheter in your belly and you arrive and have everything there that you need to do your PD with. So that's one of the advantages also, I think, of PD. Okay, great. And another one here, you know, basically about um, comparing and contrasting the different experiences, PD, home hemo and, and, and hemo in, in the center. Um, Jerry, I think that was probably two. Um. Again, everybody uh, needs to do this very closely with their nephrologist uh, way out. And we basically for my because I was traveling quite a bit and uh, just a comment on scheduling. I had a very good in center group 
and there was a person that uh, was the function was to help me schedule these trips. What I would do is go on the website and I would choose about uh, three different centers and I would, uh, based on the city that I was visiting and send those three centers and provide a time and that in-person, in-center person would then schedule the trips for me. And it usually, in, I would say it was very infrequent that I could uh, get a, uh, a, a schedule. And your sister and dad had different experiences that then? Uh, my, my sister uh, on Parrot Neal, uh, she, she, did, uh, she didn't really travel a lot uh, to begin with. So uh, most of that was done at home. And, uh, but she, she did have success with uh, Parrot Neal. I, I can answer that. Is what, Jerry, are you done? Sorry, I might be cutting yes, you off. Yes, yes. Um, the, you know, there's never been a head-to-head, -head, well done, head-to-head -head study of the three modalities. Um, it's, they tried even to randomize patients, if you can imagine, to your dialysis modality. This was done in China, but it failed. Um, and there's bias. You know, if you try to compare home hemo to in-center hemo, they're different patients that serve the most motivated and healthier patients would be at home because if you crash a lot on dialysis, we're not going to let you go home. So you can't make these comparisons with existing data. So most of what we know is, um, well, I, I will say there is one randomized uh, trial. It is three times a week in center versus six times a week short in center. And that was supposed to be close to home, the six times a week uh, short treatments. And it showed improved survival and reduced um, left ventricular mass, so heart mass, in the people who were doing the short daily treatments. <clears throat> the same thing was found actually with long nocturnal sessions. So I didn't mention this, but you can't, some centers um, allow nocturnal dialysis. So you would be running at night, you, you work in the day, and then three times a week, you would go to the inpatient center. The in, it's an outpatient facility, but you would go to dialysis at you know, 8 p.m. and hook up until one, until like whatever, 5 a.m. and everybody's got a different schedule. You can also even allow for nocturnal dialysis at home with monitoring, okay, remotely. Um, that actually was better than three times a week. So these very long sessions that showed benefit. Um, so I, I have to say, I think we do have decent data to say that three times a week in center is the worst of, of compared to the short daily at home or short daily in center. Um, PD versus hemo, we don't have data. And here's my personal opinion on this. When you have residual renal function, i.e. Your, your kidneys are still working a little bit, i.e. you're still making urine, you know, that actually helps so much for volume. There's a little bit of hormonal function still coming from kidneys. You still make epigen, for example. And you, you, you ma maintaining that kidney function is just very critical, I think. So while your kidneys are still working a little bit, even though it's not enough to be without dialysis, but they're doing something and they're definitely producing urine, so your volume restriction isn't as much. I'd say you're best to stay on PD if you, if you like it and if you tolerate it. You'll tolerate it, it's just do you like it, okay? And then once your re residual renal function wears out, I would say you're best to switch to, to home hemo. You already know how to, you've already used to the home kind of dialysis sort of mantra that you're, you're taking care of yourself, okay? It is going to be more involved to do the home dialysis, but I think you, these people can learn it more readily. They're already quite, they've shown such motivation to in doing the PD. So that's how I personally feel about it. Once your residual renal function wears off, you're going to end up being tied to that PD machine quite a bit or like having to do quite a bit of exchanges. So at that point, I, I personally would suggest you try home hemo then or start off with home hemo is another way to do this. They're all better. Those two are for sure six times a week versus three times we have a randomized clinical trial. No question, that's better. The PD versus in center, we don't have a trial, but all of our observational data suggests it's better. And it's been my personal experience as well. I've had patients who've done all three, like 30 year end stage renal disease patients, and they definitely feel much better at home on hemo or, and that's doing four times a week, usually at least four to six times a week than they did three times a week in center or PD even felt better than three times a week. Okay, thanks, Dana. Um, 
got a few more questions coming in now. A, a couple here are also related to PD, so let's deal with those first. Um, first question, I'll ask them both together and you, you can answer them how you wish. Do people with huge kidneys have trouble with being so full from being on PD? Uh, and secondly, how dangerous is PD if you want to swim in the ocean a lot? Okay, great questions. Um, yeah, remarkably, we can still do PD and PKD patients. So, and I say this to everybody, you, you can't really know to try it. So one good thing about all this is you just pick your modality and, and it, it's not the end all be all. If you don't like it or it's catheter's not working well for whatever reason, they reposition it and you're just tired of it, whatever. And that's unusual, by the way, that we would have to reposition a catheter, but sometimes they have. Or you just feel too full. Um, they can't get enough volume in to make these exchanges efficient, which I think is quite rare, by the way, even in PKD. We man it's re remarkably, we can get PD to work. Um, then you would switch to hemo, but no, PKD is not a contraindication to PD. You would try it. We, we do it. It works. Um, the other thing about swimming the ocean, once the catheter's healed, which is two to three weeks, Okay, so that tunnel seals over. So basically you have this catheter that's, I already told you, is like inserted through the abdominal wall and then there's a tunnel maybe three inches long. That thing seals off usually two to three weeks. After that, we say you can go swimming in an ocean and in a private chlorinated pool. We don't like you to swim in public pools and no saunas. That's the rule of thumb. So if you want to go swimming in the ocean, you can do as much as you want of it as long as your catheter is two to three weeks old, sealed up. Great stuff. Um, and, he, and here's a question now related to hemo uh, and ports specifically. What, why are ports not done more for hemo as opposed to, 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 um, uh, to fistulas? Uh, well, the ports get infected. They get all this quite literally slime all over the end of it. It's called a venous sheath and a biofilm. You take a catheter out, it's covered in bacterial biofilm even it hadn't been there for more than a, you know, a couple of weeks. So they, they do develop infections over time because it's exogenous material. You know, it's basically a, a very specialized kind of plastic that's going in your body. Um, th the other problem is that they clot. You develop these clots at the end of the, the catheter has two or three holes in the end of the catheter and it's sitting in a vein, right? So at the end of that, you end up getting caught and, and fibrous material developing. So the flow goes down, they eventually have to take the thing out and replace it. So we don't like ports. They're not, they're not durable in the sense they clot off easily and they also get infected. And those infections are serious. It's a bloodstream infection. And by the way, that catheter tip sits right at the top of your heart. It's right in the superior vena cava usually or in the right atrium. So you're at risk to develop endocarditis, which is an infection of the heart valve. If you have a catheter infection, we see it all the time. So it really is advisable not to dose with a catheter, unless it's a temporary thing where you got a living donor set up or something, you know, and you're going to get that in a couple months. Otherwise, get a fistula. Okay, there's no more questions in the chat. So please, if you if you have a burning question in the back of your mind, add it into the chat, and, and we can ask it. Um, I'll, I'll, add, I'll add a question myself while, uh, to give people a chance to type. Um, what, once you've had a transplant and you've been on, uh, on hemo, um, do, do people tend to have fistulas removed or, or do, they, do they tend to, to, to keep them in afterwards? Uh, Jerry, do you still have your fistula? Well, I'm, in, in my case, it's six and a half years and uh, I still have my fistula. And uh, yeah. it's a question the, uh, the nephrologist keeps asking me, you know, how does it feel? And uh, it feels fine. I mean, obviously it's athletics with the fistula on the arm, but uh, other than that, mine's actually minimal in size. So rather than, than doing that, what I chose to do is uh, have two nephrectomies. Uh, I had the first in uh, three years prior to the transplant, and I had the second one done six months after the transplant. And I found that removing the large disease kidneys made a huge difference for me. Um, we generally don't remove a fistula unless there's a complication with it. Uh, the, complica the complication would be that it becomes so large and what we call aneurysmal, that the walls of the vein are so stretched out that they're at risk to rupture. And the skin would 
be thinning and it can have white patches on it. And, and we would be monitoring, like your doctor is monitoring your fistula, Jerry, wondering about that. That's more typical in an upper arm than a lower arm fistula. Okay, so that would be a reason we would quote ligate. We, we don't take them out, what we do is cut, cut, tie them off. Yeah. Um, the other would be if you had an infection, if, it would be unusual to develop an infection in fistula. It's only your native veins. If you have a graft, a, a fistula could be, a, an infection could be more likely, but those, would, we would not do it unless there was an indication. Or I suppose the other thing is if you had steel to a hand that you weren't getting enough blood flow to your distal limb, okay? Because the thing was growing with, with time, we would also ligate a fistula for that reason. And what if anything do you do with the graft after a transplant is a follow-up question. Yeah, and, same, and, and Jerry, yeah, can you, same thing. And there's a question, Jerry, can, can, can you show us your fistula? <laughs> can you get it in front of a camera? <laughs> Let me see if I could pull up my sleeve. But as a bonus, while, Jerry, while Jerry's doing it. Oh, the, I see. And, and I've had a transplant now, so that this is an old fistula in, in my case. So there you go. A bonus from the host. <laughs> and we've just got to, Oh, there we go. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and I just uh, we've just got a couple of minutes left. Uh, Jerry, uh, any chance you can talk about your nephrectomy experience briefly? Yes, I uh, the same team that did my transplant actually did the uh, nephrectomy, and uh, I was getting a lot of cysts hemorrhages on my left left kidney, and uh, it was determined that I had quite a few very large cysts, and when the cysts would uh, hemorrhage. I, it was uh, extremely painful. So it was a decision early on to, uh, to take out the left one first. And then the thought process was that I would get the, sec the right one taken out during the transplant process. However, the kidney that I got was from far and they didn't have enough time to do both surgeries. That's why I went back in six months. But after it, before the nephrectomy, I was, uh, it was very uncomfortable, especially sleeping. If you would roll over on those large cysts, it would wake me up. And after I had those both removed, uh, it, the comfort level was significant. But as far as the, the surgery itself, uh, I did in uh, all three cases, the two nephrectomy and the, the transplant, I bounced back very quickly. I was it was a three-day procedure in the hospital for three days. And then uh, I literally, in all three cases, did not have to go on pain meds. And uh, I, I was very, it was very successful for me. And just fi one final question. Are fistulas painful? I can say mine was not, um, I think. If it is, you need to seek medical attention. There's yeah. something wrong with it. It shouldn't yeah. be painful. Yeah, mine, mine was not painful. No, mine. Okay, folks. Well, that looks like we've covered all the questions. Um, Diana, Jerry, any, any additional comments before we finally wrap up? Well, I'll just say this. I think it's scary to be thinking about starting dialysis, but we do really, our patients do really, really well on dialysis. And you got two people here who were on dialysis previously. Look how amazing they look here. Proof of concept. But I, I would say learn educate yourself about these, about dialysis, the modalities, like Jerry said, work with your doctor to figure out which one is right for you, go with it. And then if you don't like it, you can always switch. I really encourage you to try to stay home. It is just good for you mentally, physically, everything wise. Uh, if you can manage to, to do it at home, that I think patients will, are just happier and do better in this way. And PKD patients are most savvy, engaged, motivated, like educated, um, kind of into it patients we have. So PKD patients are the ones that I really think can be at home. I would just add a comment. Um, it's so important to try to keep a positive uh, attitude and try to keep occupied outside of dialysis. And uh, the, other, the other thing is uh, I viewed, like I said, I viewed in my case, since I was very healthy going into this is I view dialysis as a stepping stone to, to get a transplant and to try to, to keep 
I, I tried to keep exercising as much as I could, and I was quite healthy going into each of the surgeries.